So welcome everyone. You know, Grand Rounds can't start um, a new year without some new technological equipment or something else. So I've got the old microphone and our Grand Rounds speaker has the fancy new microphone. So welcome everyone to the very first Grand Rounds of the fall. It's hard to believe that the summer has gone by and I hope all of you had some time to sit in the warm weather and watch a sunset, do something where you got out and enjoyed um, summer as long as it's here. So those of you who come to Grand Rounds know I, I like to say some little either meteorological or natural phenomenon and I don't have anything fantastic today except uh, one great thing. The fireflies, which are normally not out anymore at this time of year, are still popping out of my lawn at dusk. And so that's a sign that summer isn't entirely over. So today, I am very honored for our first Grand Rounds of the year to be given by one of our very uh, preeminent physician scientists, Dr. Mark Burkhart. Dr. Burkhart will be talking about enhancing treatment, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him today before he comes up to talk. He's an associate professor in the Division of Hematology Oncology. He holds several leadership positions. I'm going to mention two today. He's the associate director of the UW Medical Science Scientist Training Program and the chair of the UW Carbon Cancer Center WON Precision Medicine Tumor Board. He did his undergraduate degree, interestingly, in mathematical physics, which makes a lot of sense in the work that he does now. He did his MD-PhD at University of Rochester, where he did his PhD in chemistry, and the MD uh, was at the School of Medicine and Dentistry in Rochester. He then went on and did his internal medicine residency training in the medicine, in the, in the research scientist pathway at New York Presbyterian Hospital, the Cornell campus, followed by his oncology fellowship at Sloan Kettering. We were very lucky to be able to recruit him to join us on faculty here in 2008. And one of the things um, I'm gonna talk about in his awards is that Dr. Burkhart is, a, is truly a, a, a triple threat in, in the work he does in education uh, and in academic science uh, and in taking care of patients. He has had over 50 peer-reviewed articles since he's joined us on faculty. He has three patents. He has 10 active grants, including an R01 and a Department of Devel uh, DOD award, Breakthrough Award. And when I looked through uh, what people say to him as far as his uh, honors and awards, he's received multiple times the UW Health Patient and Family Experience Provider Champion Award. Any of you who've gotten that know that's a very small percentage of us for our clinical care. He's received the Paige Grossman Professionalism Award from the Department of Medicine. He's received the Dean's Teaching Award through the University uh, of School of Medicine and Public Health and the Coleman Madison Award for Commitment to Research and Treatment on Breast Cancer. So that really speaks to his triple threat. When I asked him before his talk right now, you know, what is he most proud of? And it's really his work uh, in precision medicine and organizing precision medicine across campus and in the department uh, to move this area forward. So with this, Dr. Burkhart, please come up. With the fan Thank you for that very kind introduction. I feel like Steve Jobs with this new microphone. And I thought I should have worn the black turtleneck. Uh, uh, but I didn't know this was happening. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I uh, thank you, Betsy, for that very kind introduction and, um, uh, and for inviting me to do this. So I'm interested in breast cancer, but uh, also I'm interested in precision medicine, how we can be smarter about how we treat our patients with cancer. And what I'm gonna talk about today uh, focuses a little more broad than breast cancer. First, it's about how we do uh, new testing and next generation sequencing of cancers and why that's important. Uh, then some new technology that we're working on in the laboratory in terms of using this to measure something called chromosomal instability, so I'll tell you what that is, and how that's useful, we think, for the precision approaches of uh, making more our current therapies more precise. And finally, I'm going to tell you about something we learned from a patient who uh, uh, I met and how that uh, led to uh, some work on uh, extreme survivors. And I think this 
may lead to a precision approach of finding people who we don't need to treat as aggressively as we usually do in oncology. So let me tell you about the first story. So this gets back to a really old problem in oncology. And you, we all know that uh, back in the 19th century, uh, the, the treatment of cancer was largely surgical. So if it was breast cancer, the surgeon would do breast surgery. If it was lung cancer, lung surgery. If it was colon cancer, colon surgery. And so naturally, for over a century, we've classified most of the solid tumors that occur by where they occur. And when we look under the microscope, we see the histology that's characteristic of that solid tumor type. But it's changing. Over the past 40 years, medical oncologists ha and others have found medicines uh, that work. And at first, we had pretty crude medicines called chemotherapies that may work for many different types of cancer. But we're now understanding differences between cancers uh, that are driven by genetics. And, and it turns out not all lung cancers look the same genetically. Not all breast cancers look the same genetically. Probably not a surprise. But in order to see that, you sometimes have to, you need a new tool. And the tool we're now applying to our cancer patients is the DNA sequencer. So the microscope, uh, Lewin Hook uh, discovered that a couple centuries ago, DNA sequencers, newer technology, uh, and we're uh, updating that classification. But it's still a challenge because we typically classify cancer by breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, rather than the genes. But this is changing, and the reason it's changing now is because of technology. So uh, I, how many of you remember the Human Genome Project that finished in 2001? Good, so I'm not the only one old enough to remember that. It's not that long ago, 18 years ago. Uh, that cost $100 million. It used basically an upgraded form of 1970s technology to do the sequencing. And after that was complete, uh, the uh, NIH, our federal government, invested in technology, and that technology has driven the cost per genome down tremendously. So last night I just received an email, and what it said was, for $400 I could get a whole exome sequence of a patient for 400 bucks at 100 depth. So I can see all 20,000 genes, full sequence, 100 times sequence of each gene, uh, 400 bucks. So the, the price has really been driven down in this. And so what happens when you apply this to cancer? What, what happens if you just, why don't we just do this for everyone? So a few years ago, the folks at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, invested basically $100 million in a program that uh, just said, everyone who comes into our cancer center, we're gonna do DNA sequencing on their tumors. We're gonna do DNA sequencing on their blood. And doing it on the tumors, of course, is important because cancer has mutations that caused it to turn into cancer. So the DNA sequence of the cancer is different than the DNA sequence of the person, and it reveals what's driving the growth of cancer. So they consented patients who came in. They got blood and tumor samples. They extracted the DNA in number three here. And then they did sequencing, uh, had all the bioinformatics, had a review, put it in a huge database of all their patients, and then gave a report, matched patients to clinical trials, and put it in a database called CBioPortal. And in 2017, they published the results for the first 10,000 10, patients that went through this program. And what they found was this, that um, if you look at the, the types of treatments you found, uh, you could find a lot of things that you might not have selected just by the histology. And this graph shows the percent of patients with targeted therapies with diff different levels of evidence that were found by doing the DNA sequencing. And what you can see is about one third of the patients had a drug that was selected based on the DNA of testing. And if you wanna take the, the pessimist view, two thirds didn't, okay? Uh, so that you also see. But one third did, um, and this was the drugs of four or five years ago, and this technology is changing, new drugs are becoming available, the levels of evidence are changing. So it's kind of a moving target, but even a few years ago it was a third of the patients. And if you look at which genes they found that they could target, here's the list, the most common one being PI3 kinase, the uh, EGFR, uh, ERB2, also known as HER2. And if you look at the diseases, if you wanna say, well, what diseases did you help? Interestingly, there's a spectrum. Some cancers 
clearly had a higher preponderance of genes that could have drugs for them, and some had lower. So gastrointestinal stromal tumor is at the top. Usually that's driven by CKIT. Uh, thyroid cancer, breast cancer, melanoma. There's a whole host of cancers where a large fraction of those patients could find a targeted drug. By the other end of the spectrum, uh, there were cancers such as small cell lung cancer, prostate, osteosarcoma, where only a tiny fraction had a, uh, a genetic target. So again, if you're, if you're a pessimist, you say, okay, well, it makes sense to sequence these and not these, but on the other hand, the drugs are changing, the targets are changing, and um, some of these patients do have things you can find and help them. So the optimists say, let's test everyone. So this has uh, been changing how we view things. And one really important thing that happened, happened in 2017. And it's based on this paper. I'm showing you the graphs from the paper. Before 2017, every drug approved for, for solid tumor cancers was approved for breast cancer or lung cancer or melanoma. And if you had lung cancer, you got a lung cancer drug. Breast cancer, breast cancer drug. Melanoma, melanoma drug. But in 2017, this study came out that showed that any cancer, no matter what, for solid tumors, no matter what type, if it had a certain genetic characteristic, there was, there was a drug that seemed to work quite well. And that gen genetic ca characteristic was called microsatellite instability, abbreviated MSI, and the drug was called pembrolizumab. So this is one of the newer immunotherapy. So it's a monoclonal antibody that sticks to a receptor on T cells and basically upregulates the activity of T cells. And if you have a microsatellite instability in your tumor, what seems to happen is you, get, uh, you have problems with repairing DNA and you get mutations all over your tumor. So many mutations that it looks foreign to the immune system and the immune system can detect it better. So that was the rationale for this study. And what you see in the, in the pie chart is each color, um, this is a little bit out of focus. I don't know if we can fix that, Clint, uh, but it's a little out of focus even for me up here. But uh, each color is a different type of cancer. Colon cancer is the most common to have this characteristic, but there's a host of other cancers. Endometrial or uterine is a big one, a uh, whole host of cancers. What this is on the bottom is a waterfall plot. So this shows a, uh, each patient is a different bar on this plot, and it shows how the tumor size changed from before treatment to after the treatment was given. And what you can see on this waterfall plot for an oncologist, this looks really good, um, that this fraction of patients over here, their tumors disappeared 100%. So we don't see that often. And this fraction of patients had substantial reduction in their tumor sizes. So this seems to have been uh, you know, quite an effective drug for these patients and um, was the first time the FDA said, we're approving a drug not for lung cancer or breast cancer or colon cancer, we're approving a drug for a gene result. We don't care what cancer it is. And so this is now FDA approved. So again, this got us rethinking of how we're classifying cancer. Now in breast cancer, doing DNA tests has become important too, and we have other more and more drugs for breast cancer. So this uh, was a drug called Olaparib. It's, a, it's a, a drug called a PARP inhibitor. These are known to work in cancers that have genes called BRCA1 or 2 that are mutated, which is a common breast cancer gene. And in this study, what you see is patients who received Olaparib are shown in red, and those that the, the doctor just gave them standard chemotherapy are shown in blue. And this is a progression-free survival plot. So over time, they, uh, they had, uh, uh, you could see that if they got the PARP inhibitor, it took longer for the cancer to grow. So for breast cancer, we have a targeted drug for a gene now. So we, new kind of breast cancer. And then just uh, a few months ago, back in May, there was another FDA approval of a drug for a gene. So 25% of hormone-sensitive breast cancers have a gene mutated. That looks great, Clint, thank you. 25% uh, uh, have a mutation in a gene called PIK3CA, and there's a drug that turns off that enzyme. And that was approved based on this, whereas pa where patients who got this had a longer progression-free survival. 
Now, there are some problems with, with some of these drugs. They're not chemotherapy, but they can have uh, adverse effects. With PIK3CA, that's important for insulin signaling. So often it drives people's glucose up and it has to be monitored. Many of these patients get metformin in addition. But in any case, we're having more and more drugs driven by the genes rather than driven by what kind of cancer it is. So in breast cancer, again my focus, uh, there are a bunch of emerging drugs based on genes. And again, this gets to how pessimistic you are, but some of these genes are found only in a couple percent of breast cancer. So do you test everyone to find that and help them? Uh, I, we say yes, I'll see what you think in a minute. But uh, we have 2% of breast cancers that have mutations in a gene called HER2, also known as ERB2. This is distinct from the classic HER2 breast cancer, which is not a mutation, and, but an amplification. So when we find those, we have drugs to treat those patients on clinical trials. There are emerging drugs called AKT1 inhibitors that work uh, and have shown uh, some efficacy in the patients that have activating mutations of this, and that's only about 2% of breast cancers. And you can see the waterfall plot here that some patients had substantial reductions of tumor size with the first generation drug. We're finding mutations and gene fusions in the estrogen receptor gene, and what that's revealing is why our, cancer, why our patients' cancers are becoming resistant to the estrogen blockers we often use. And there are second and third generation drugs targeting those mutant versions of estrogen receptor. So it's becoming more and more important in terms of developing drugs and for applying FDA-approved drugs to know what the, the DNA sequence of patients' tumors are. Now this is an interesting case, and, and I'm going to get your thoughts on this one in a minute, because this is something that you find very rarely in cancer. And it's not just breast cancer, but it can be in any cancer. So there's this, uh, there's this neurotrophin family of receptors, and they're encoded by the genes NTRUC, if you want to call it that, 1, 2, and 3, and the protein name is TRKA, B, and C. And these are almost always expressed in uh, nerves, and they control nervous functions, as you see there. And they're not expressed in epithelial cells, not expressed in breast tissue, lung tissue, or other tissue, ordinarily. But once in a while, a cancer has a genetic change in the DNA that causes this, the genome to be rearranged. And this, this gene that's not normally expressed in the epithelial cells is translocated to a gene that is expressed in epithelial cells. And so you get this promoter driving uh, protein uh, expression in, a, in an epithelial cell. And what that does is drive the growth, uh, the signaling, to uh, stimulate cancer cells to grow. Now this happens extremely rarely. It's somewhere about one in a thousand or two in a thousand cancers. But it also turns out that if you have it, in your particular cancer or in your patient's cancer, there's a drug that was FDA approved uh, last November based on this evidence, uh, and that drug's called larotrectinib or LOXO-101. And what you can see, again, is the waterfall plot. There were many different types of cancer here, so each color, I won't read them all to you, but every color is a different type of cancer, but they all had this NTRK fusion of either gene one, two, or three, and this drug turned them off. And what you can see is these tumors had uh, completely disappeared after receiving the drug. Most of the patients, the tumors shrank remarkably in response to this drug. So this has led to a philosophic question of, do we test everyone for this, this gene that might only be found in one in a thousand cancers, but if it is, we have a pretty remarkable drug. So uh, what do you all think? Do we, ha we have an FDA-approved drug, it has better effects than chemotherapy, but you only find it in one in a thousand people. Do you test everyone? Yeah? Well, yeah, yeah, some people, right. Once you bill insurance, it's a little more than that, it turns out. But, uh, so, you know, this, this is the quandary we're in in the field of oncology. Not everyone is tested, and maybe there's some reasons why, a lot of financial and billing and other reasons, but we have these very rare things that can help patients profoundly. 
Here's an amazing case related to this, and it's the only case I know of of breast cancer with this that's in the literature. So uh, the folks at Memorial Sloan Kettering were running that trial, and then there was this international tumor board where people were presenting cases. And there was a young girl from Bangladesh, 14 years old, who had breast cancer, which almost never happens. It's a very <laughs> rare thing. Also, this breast cancer was of the secretory type, which is also very unusual, but is associated with these NTREC genes. So this girl was presented in the International Tumor Board. The pathologist said it's secretory. And she, um, and, and people, that set off signs that maybe this should be tested for one of these fusions. And sure enough, she had one of these fusions. And so they flew her into New York. She had this tumor, this exophytic tumor coming out of her chest wall. And she started on this drug. And by day six, it shrank like that. And day 20, uh, three weeks later, that drug uh, gave a really remarkable response. So uh, again, profoundly helped her. I don't know the long-term follow-up. I know a year later they were flying her to New York every six months and, and, or, or three or six months and checking on her and she was doing well, I don't know, beyond a year. So we realized, okay, it's probably important to test people, just like you told me. Um, but we, you know, it was very an, an ad hoc process. And I've been to many other cancer centers around the country in the past year or two, and it's really mostly an ad hoc process. The doctor says, hey, let's test our patient. Um, uh, the nurse says, okay, I'll organize that, and then maybe it gets done over time. But not everyone is tested. There's no central organization. So we wanted to solve that. And a few years ago, uh, Dr. Deming uh, uh, was very instrumental in this. We set up this uh, Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board. And the idea was we're going to help organize all this testing for everyone, as I'll show you in a minute. And then when we get the results, we're going to review it with an expert panel. And then we're going to find drugs for these patients, at least the ones we can find, maybe the one-third that have something that, that we can do that. And so we've done this for uh, a few years now. It's been growing and growing. We've included explicitly some of the outlying health systems. Marshfield Clinic and Gunderson have been very involved, and others, as I'll show you. Uh, it was covered in the Associated Press, which was great, so we got some national press. Uh, the state government, amazingly, with the help of the dean and the chancellor, said we're going to support this, and they provided funds, and what we've done with that is we've used those to help other systems, other, other uh, doctors and systems around the state um, get the testing done and get it all organized. Now this is what you get, so you know, I just want to peel back what, these, what we see in the molecular tumor board and, and let you have a look at the complexity, and it's kind of a mess, honestly. But what you see here is uh, our first experience with the first 30-some patients that were submitted uh, that was published a few years back, and each row on this is a different subject or patient uh, presented at the tumor board. Each column is a different gene. And each colored square means that gene had either a, a mutation or an amplification or a deletion. Something happened to that gene. And what you'll notice at first, or what I hope you can tell, is there's a lot of diversity here. It's not simple like, you know, hey, lung cancer, 200,000 cases a year, let's give a lung cancer treatment. Once you get drilled down into the genes, there's a tremendous diversity. I would challenge you to find two rows that are identical. I, I don't think you can. Uh, and so we reviewed these cases, and what you'll see in this column here is we found drugs potentially for about 10 of them. So we didn't help everyone. We didn't find drugs for everyone, but some of them we did. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so that was our experience with our first 30-some patients. And what we quickly realized was we had a big problem. And the big problem was there were all kinds of new drugs and clinical trials coming out, and we could help more patients if we bring those to Wisconsin. Uh, but, at, but there's no point in bringing them to Wisconsin for a, for a drug that only helps 1% of people unless you're testing hundreds. So if you have a drug that helps 1% of people and you test 100 people in a year, you're going to enroll one patient on your trial. So it's going to be a wasted effort. That's a lot of work. Um, at the same time, no one wanted to bring a trial here unless we're testing a lot of patients. So, we had this chicken and egg problem. We had to test everyone and we had to get trials. So the first thing uh, we were able to do, and this was with the 
great help of Dr. Oboa, who is the co-leader of a new group called the Basket Dot. And what that means is we have baskets of not lung cancer or colon cancer, but baskets according to the genes. Uh, and we said, uh, let's start opening, uh, opening trials for the genes. But let's not just open them all at once, because then we open a dozen trials and maybe we find these patients are not. Let's open them by what patients show up. So what if a patient shows up with this genetic mutation and there's a trial over here, why don't we just like hit the go button and, and go fast enough to get that patient treated? So we started meeting with the IRB, people in the cancer center, people in the pharmacy and said, could you make this happen? Because you know, this needs to happen in an accelerated manner. And amazingly, everyone said, I see why that's important and let's make that work. And so we tried that. Uh, last year, early 2018, Dr. Oboa identified a patient for a trial we didn't have open, identified the patient January 25th, uh, and within five weeks, we got our first patient treated. And over the course of the next six months, we were the lead um, accruer of this, this trial uh, internationally, and Dr. Oboa has presented it at national meetings. So um, this has helped us remarkably, uh, but uh, it also helped us find, you know, get ready to open these trials for these rare mutations. So we thought we had a solution for getting the trials here by this rapid activation process. But now we needed to get everyone tested to make it, you know, to make it work. And so we started taking over for what the clinics do, uh, what happens in the clinics. And I remember uh, what, we, what we did back in 2017 is we hired a really great coordinator, Kayla Lemon, who runs the Molecular Tumor Board team, and we expanded that later. But uh, what, what had previously happened is the nurses and doctors did this sort of an, as an ad hoc basis on the clinic, and we said, we sat down with the nurses uh, and we met with them and we said, you don't have to do this anymore, just call us, we're gonna organize all your testing for you. And I remember I got like a bunch, there was a silence for like a minute and I didn't know what was going on and what happened was one of the nurses said, what's the catch? <laughs> like no one's ever come to us and told us you, we're gonna do one less thing They've always come to us and told us to do one more thing, so there must be something going on here. So we finally convinced them, no, we really, we really are going to take this out of your hands. All you have to do is page us, send us an inbox, uh, we'll do it. And so we started doing that and taking it out of their hands and started doing this uh, consent process uh, and getting the sample tested and automatically submitting that to our molecular tumor board. So in 2017, we started screening about 20 patients a month by doing that, taking it out of the nurse's hands. Uh, and then we had it formed a contract with a company called Strata. And Strata has a model where they're gonna do the testing, they're not gonna bill insurance or the patient, and the catch is that we have to work with them on clinical trials. So they've contracted with pharma companies that are struggling to find patients to develop their drugs, uh, exactly the trials we wanted, and so we said, why don't we work together? You'll get the money from the pharma companies that are struggling to develop their drugs. We'll find the patients. We won't bill patients, we won't bill payers. Um, and, and you do the sequencing for us. So we started doing that. That made it much uh, more efficient. Uh, we didn't have to deal with payers. And we hired a second staff member and we started getting up to about 50 patients a month. And then over the past uh, several months, uh, this has gone up even uh, more, uh, where we've, we've hit about 100 a month, which is our target for UW Cancer Center, but also use some of the state funds to export this process to Marshfield and Gunderson so they could do something similar and submit all these cases to our tumor board. So now we're finally screening enough patients, and to be honest, we're not helping everyone, and when I see a patient, I say, we're gonna test your tumor, but we may or may not help you. Uh, with that, but it's an opportunity to find something. So what have we found in breast cancer? We found, of course, these mutations in HER2, uh, which we have a clinical trial for. We found mutations in the estrogen receptor gene, which we're developing a statewide clinical trial with molecular imaging with one of our radiology colleagues, uh, Amy Fowler. Uh, we found a breast cancer with something called an 
exon 19 mutation of EGFR, which doesn't happen in breast cancer. It happens in 10% of lung cancer. So her cancer was misclassified. Nevertheless, we had a drug for that. And we found a bunch of other things for which we, found, we got patients on trial. This was an interesting patient. This was a farmer uh, for, or from a farming family close to La Crosse, this, this woman, who had met amplified breast cancer. And she had this tumor that you can see on this PET scan that was all around the left side of her lung. And you can see here, full of fluid in the pleural cavity. And she was tested by our colleagues in Gunderson, and she had a MET, mutation, a MET amplification, which, again, often happens in lung cancer. There's a drug for that, uh, crizotinib. She got that drug, and about six months later, she had a pretty remarkable uh, response where there was a lot less tumor around her lung and less fluid uh, around her lung, as you can see. And so that helped her quite a bit. Unfortunately, what happened was the tumor eventually grew while she was on this drug, and uh, they repeated a biopsy, and it turned out there was a mutation in the MET gene, and that mutation was in the binding site of crizotinib, and so that made it resistant to that drug. This was our one patient, so we, uh, we've, we've now done next-generation sequencing on a, over a couple thousand patients, and as I said, one in a thousand will have these NTREC fusions. Dr. Uboa found the first one I know about, uh, which was this woman here, who she uh, inherited. This wasn't a breast cancer, but a GI stromal tumor, and it was a GI stromal tumor that did not have the classic kit mutation and did not respond to imatinib, which is the, the standard drug for this disease. And by the time she saw Dr. Uboa, she had this huge mass in her abdomen um, and a lot of fluid here, and her, her quality of life was poor, and usually a patient like this will be We'll go to hospice and we'll, we'll die shortly after this. But uh, she had testing and lo and behold, she had an NTRK1 fusion. And so Dr. Oboa discovered that and amazingly, and that's very rare, but found it and the patient got larotrectinib and by six months later, that tumor uh, regressed remarkably. And this patient is still, uh, per Dr. Oboa, doing, doing quite well. Uh, she's actually going down to Dallas as a patient advocate uh, later this month uh, that the, the maker of this drug is, you know, she's like the star. So, you know, it really took her from a situation that would have put her in the grave shortly and, and, and gave her life. So that's very rare. I'm not saying that happens often or promising that that happens, but we, we look. And if you don't look, you won't find those people who you can help profoundly. So over the past few years, this is what we've done. We've reviewed uh, over 2,300 cases. We've had 92 meetings. We've uh, implemented processes to rapidly increase the number of cases by streamlining testing. And we've incorporated into our tumor board uh, sites from around the state, Marshfield, Gunderson, but also uh, Swedish American in Northern Illinois and ProHealth and others. And so we're, we're actively trying to reach out and collaborate with colleagues around the state. And my colleague, Dr. Deming, has been very instrumental in doing translational research and has figured out how to grow these patient-derived organoids, which is a cutting edge way of modeling the cancer. So when someone gets a biopsy for a DNA testing, Dr. Deming gets a sample and grows them in the lab and studies how they respond to different drugs. So what we're hoping to do with this is uh, cover all our patients, to test all our patients and help all those who we can. We are trying to organize a statewide precision medicine database, have it linked to the biospecimens and pathology archives to enable translational research on rare patients, and develop the infrastructure for translational research. And some of my colleagues and I, uh, uh, well, my colleagues set up this Big Ten consortium, so all the Big Ten schools that uh, play football also have a cancer research group. And so we're working on getting basket trials uh, there. So that's what we're doing in precision medicine uh, in the clinic. Now I want to talk about what's going in the lab and, and some work on measuring something called chromosomal instability. So before I talk about this, what's usually confusing is this concept of what is chromosomal instability. And it gets confused with something else called aneuploidy. And they're related. Aneuploidy is, uh, tells you that you have the wrong number of chromosomes in a cell. So we all know that we have humans, 23 chromosomes. We usually have two sets. 
In someone with Down syndrome, for instance, they have an extra chromosome 21, and that happens in every cell, but it's identical in every cell in their body. So that's aneuploidy. They have the wrong number of chromosomes, but there's no, there's no cell-cell variation. By contrast, there's something called chromosomal instability. This instability means that in the process of cells dividing, the cells can get the wrong number of chromosomes. And so when you look at cells, you might see different karyotypes in each cell in the same person. And that happens on a very rare disease called mosaic variegated aneuploidy, where a person can be born with this condition where different cells have different uh, karyotypes. So yes, the, the chromosomal instability causes aneuploidy, but it really is about the variation in, in um, chromosomes in each cell. So the chromosomal instability happens a lot in cancer, and it happens a lot because this process of mitosis is dysregulated. And uh, what you see here is an ordinary mitosis uh, seen uh, in high-tech microscopy where you have DNA that's condensed into chromosomes, and then it's aligned on this mitotic spindle uh, shown in green. Those are microtubules in green. And then the chromosomes get segregated into the daughter cells. So that's an ordinary mitosis. Now, in 1890, chromosomal instability was first detected. So a guy named von Hansmann took the old coal tar dyes that led to the discovery of chromosomes. This was before we knew chromosomes had DNA or were genetic material. But could stain these uh, skin cancer cells and saw that mitosis was weird. And it was weird in many different ways. And you can imagine here that the cell that's, you know, kind of organized the chromosomes in three ways uh, didn't get it quite right when it sorted them out. And this cell, when it was dividing, you know, had clearly more here than here. So many uh, tumors, as we've known for 128 years, have this property called chromosomal instability, because we could see it happening. We still don't really understand why this happens. We know a lot about the genetics of cancer, but the causes of chromosomal instability are still unclear. So uh, Alka Chaudhary, uh, 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 a PhD in the lab, has worked on measuring this and quantifying this in breast cancer organoids. So the same organoids we grow from patient biopsies can be uh, analyzed and visualized for these mitotic abnormalities. So we're in the process of quantifying that by measuring the uh, mitotic abnormalities, sort of, sort of an update of what von Hansmann did in the 1890s. But why do we think that's important? So we can measure it. You know, we're working on measuring it, but Mark, why do you care what, you know, what the measures are? We care because we think it's important for this drug called Taxol. So Taxol is a drug that we've had since, uh, uh, that was discovered in, in the 60s. So Arthur Barclay's uh, a, uh, basically a botanist, and he went out into the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, which is near Mount St. Helens in, in Washington, and he and his graduate students picked up uh, thousands of samples of different plants. And he sent those uh, samples right here to the University of Wisconsin, the USDA lab, right across the street. They made, made extracts of all these plants, sent them to the National Cancer Institute, and the National An Cancer Institute screened all these extracts, and lo and behold, one of the extracts was killing cancer cells in the lab, and it came from the bark of this tree, the Pacific yew. And so no one knew what was in that extract, but these guys, uh, Dr. Wall and Dr. Wani, were at Research Triangle Institute, and they spent like five years trying to purify the actual substance that was in that that bark, and it turned out to be a drug called Taxol. And that drug has had a remarkable history and impact in the oncology community. We learned in the late uh, uh, 70s from Sandy Horwitz at uh, Einstein that this can cause microtubules to stick together in an unusual way. And so what you see here is uh, the optical density of a microtubules in in a solution. So you put the microtubules in a test tube, and then you change the temperature and they polymerize. And when they polymerize, the, the mixture gets cloudy, and so the optical density goes up. And then when you change the temperature back, they depolymerize, and the, the solution gets clear again, so the optical density is low. But if you start adding taxol, the, they don't depolymerize very well. 
So it causes the microtubules to be stabilized and stuck together. So we've known that for decades, and during the 1980s, it was pretty clear what happened in the lab is the cells got stuck during mitosis and then they died. But what happens in the clinic? So even though this is a remarkable drug, it clearly doesn't help everyone. What we've seen in breast cancer, uh, this is one of the trials in metastatic breast cancer published several years ago, is, and this is a waterfall plot again. So each line here is a different patient, and the line shows how much their tumor shrank. So for these three patients, it was great. The tumors went away completely. But for almost half the patients, hardly anything happened. And no one's been able to predict who that is. So everyone, you know, when I go to clinic and I have a patient with metastatic cancer, and there's a problem, I say, well, one of our best drugs is paclitaxel, let me give that to you, and let's hope you're down here. But we don't really want to hope, we want to be more precise. We want to say, you're one of the people who are going to be helped. So Beth Weaver uh, is a collaborator in cell and regenerative biology and, and McCardell Labs, and her uh, graduate student, who's now a postdoc at MIT, Lauren Zacidel, started working with us to answer the question of why this is. And the first thing we did is we stepped back and said, is how are cancers being killed by Taxol? Is it really working the same as we thought? And in the past, as I said, people thought this. You give Taxol, it stabilizes the microtubules like I showed you. The cells get stuck during mitosis, and they can't get through because their microtubules won't move, and then they die. So for you know, a few decades, that's what people thought, and that was the dominant model. So we said, well, let's test that model. And the way we're gonna test that is we're, we're gonna, let's just find out in our patients what's happening. So we uh, asked patients to volunteer where they had the standard workup for their breast cancer. And patients with a new breast cancer, we started standard chemotherapy, but we gave that drug, uh, paclitaxel, also known as Taxol, 20 hours later biopsied their tumor and said, what's happening in the tumor? Are the cells getting stuck in mitosis? And does that mean that the tumor uh, shrank? And then they finished their standard four doses of paclitaxel. We repeated the measurements of the tumor to see if it shrank. So this is what we found. And it was to our great surprise that what we found was that getting cells getting stuck during mitosis wasn't necessary, nor was it sufficient for tumor regressions. And we could see that here. So we were measuring the mitotic cells here, and we counted the number of cells that were mitotic before and after treatment, before and after, before and after, and we measured whether the tumor shrank. And what we found was that these tumors shrank very well, even though there was no significant change in the mitotic arrest. So it seemed to have very little to do with that. So we measured the doses that we were reaching in those patient tumors, and we went back to the lab and started modeling that with cell lines, cell lines that had fluorescent DNA, fluorescent microtubules shown in red and green respectively. And in control cells, you could make videos. You know, so this is a cancer cell in the lab where you could watch mitosis. So a normal cell has a very nice division. You saw all the chromosomes, all the red stuff got, got to the uh, cells normally. Then we gave paclitaxel, the drug mimicking what was in the patients. And the cells didn't quite get stuck in mitosis they started forming these weird microtubules, these weird spindles. And as a result of that, the, it looked like the chromosomes were getting sorted into the wrong cells. So our model is that this drug paclitaxel isn't working by killing cells in mitosis, but by changing how the chromosomes get sorted out. And, and, uh, and then that, in some tumors, is lethal, and in other tumors, they don't care, because they can tolerate some of that. So Andrew Lynch in my lab has explored this. He said, if that's true, what I should see is every cell should have a different set of chromosomes. And he started applying uh, this DNA sequencing technology to this. So he took cells, treated them with this drug, and before that, and what he did is he took every DNA sequence that he got for whole genome sequencing, so this is 0.1x whole genome sequencing on an Illumina. He had all these DNA sequences, he mapped them to the reference genome, and then he binned them and said, in every 100 megabases, how many sequences did I find? And then he plotted how often he found those. And each dot is a different uh, bin. And what you could see here is 
if you look at all the sequences on chromosome one, they kind of fell into this range, at least the number of counts, where uh, it looked like they were diploid. And all the cells all across was consistent with two cro chromosomes, except perhaps chromosome four looked like a little less in this cell line. And then he treated them with Taxol, took a, you know, a million cells and did this again, and it looked exactly the same. And you, know, you might say, why, why is that? Because you showed me that what Taxol does is it causes the chromosomes to go in the wrong cell. But when you take a million cells, you get all the cells. And, I, and you didn't lose any chromosomes. They just went into the wrong cell. So if you take all the cells together in bulk, it doesn't look like anything. So he said, what we have to do is look at each cell individually to see this. And so he started doing this where he took a flow sorting, sorted them into single cells, uh, and did this analysis on single cells. And when he did that, each cell was very different. So each cell had a different number of chromosomes, either too many, too few, and there was a lot of variation. And so what we believe is that the taxol is causing this chromosomal instability. It's inducing it, and some cells don't tolerate that. And our model that we have some other data for that I'm not showing is this. That in cancer, uh, there's this property called chromosomal instability that von Hansmann saw many years ago, but it varies. In each patient, uh, some patients have a high level of it, some patients have a low level, and some are in this range. And cancers are fine with it. You know, we, we can tolerate some level of gains and loss of chromosomes. But if you have taxol, what happens is it shifts that curve and pushes them all over into a higher level. And so we think those that started over here moved into this range where the cancer can't survive anymore. But if you started over here, you did just fine with taxol. So we're hoping we can use this information to predict who responds to taxol. So in that, what we're looking in the future is uh, quantitative measurements in patients of chromosomal instability. And we're doing this similar experiment. Christina Scribano, who's a graduate student in the Weaver Lab, is looking at a different dose and schedule of taxol to see if we see the same effects in patients' tumors. So that's ongoing right now. Okay, so that's some work we're doing to improve precision of a drug we use in clinic all the time. But I want, I want to talk to you about a, a group of patients that maybe we're treating too much. I, I don't know, but we're trying to find out. And this story starts with a patient who gave me permission to talk about her. Uh, her name is Peg. She was in the newspaper. And uh, what, one day she walked into clinic, uh, and, and I met her for the first time, and she told me the story that was amazing. What she told me was she got breast cancer in 1978, and she learns that she had breast cancer uh, that returned to a metastatic site in the early 1980s. Now, usually if you have metastatic breast cancer, that means your cancer is not going to be cured, and most people are going to die of that. She told me, I thought I was going to die, um, but lo and behold, I outlived my oncologist. <laughs> and then I had Paul Carbone, and I outlived him. <laughs> and now I have you. And <laughs> I, I said, I, I'm not sure I want to be your oncologist. <laughs> Um, but that's a very interesting story, and so I'd like to know how that happened. And so um, we began to explore this. And the first thing we did is say, are there more women like you? So what happens with breast cancer? When you have breast cancer, um, what you expect to happen for patients is this. This, this was put together by Rachel Yan, who is an a fantastic undergrad in the lab who's now at Rutgers in medical school. But if most people with breast cancer are going to have surgery, maybe adjuvant therapy, and about 80% of them are going to be free of the cancer in the long run, but about 20% are going to develop metastatic cancer. And then what happens to them in terms of their living? Well, if you survive your breast cancer, you don't die of breast cancer. If it's gone, you don't die of it. If you have metastatic cancer, most people are going to die of that in a relatively short time. But once in a while, you have someone like Peg. That's you know, an outlier, and, and we don't really understand why. So my colleague at um, University of Alabama, she looked at all the SEER data, and this was hard to do, but she pulled together all the SEER Medicare data, found all the metastatic patients, and plotted their survival. And what she found was this, that if you find someone 
that survives 22 years from the original diagnosis and they have metastatic cancer, there's only two in a thousand people will have that, will live that long. So PEG is clearly, you know, an outlier uh, heading on 40 years. We started to look at our patients here at UW. We said, let's find all our patients. We found 53 who were at least 10 years out. That was our cutoff. And, you know, they had some interesting characteristics. There were different breast cancer types, but the dominant, as you might expect, was the hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative. Um, and if you plotted their survival over time, you got this. So here was Peg. She diagnosed 1978, recurred as metastatic in the early 80s, and lived for over three decades. And then uh, there was one other patient who recurred way later and then lived 10 more years with metastatic disease. So there's a lot of variety of experiences uh, with this. And we said, it, the answer must be in the genes. We, I'm not sure this is right, but this was our first thought. The answer is in the genes, and let's look at the genes in the tumor. So this is Rachel, who I told you about a minute ago, Stephanie McGregor from Pathology, and Jen Lafine from the, the Collaborative Genomics Corps, and they helped us do whole exome sequencing of these patients' tumors. And what we got was a bit of a mess. We, we, didn't, we thought, you know, maybe we'll discover a new gene that's in all these patients, and that explains why they lived. But there wasn't. You know, we saw a wide variety of genes, kind of like what I showed you before. But, uh, so one thought was maybe that's not the answer. Another thought was maybe 14 patients' DNA testing isn't enough, because there's a little bit of variety. So we went and wrote a grant to the Avon Foundation, and we said, let's, let's uh, use social media and recruit these patients from all over. And this happened because when PEG was in the newspaper, people started emailing me, can I participate in your study? Can I participate? And some of them were, were, were quite far away. So we said, okay, let's just create a way that they can participate. Got a grant funded, set up this website here that you can still, it's still open, so you can go there and um, uh, went, used social media. Susan Love advertised it uh, for her army of women, and we just started uh, letting people, if they wanted to, participate. And the advocate said, Mark, you have to, it, it, it's probably not just the genes, you have to find out what we're doing, you know, what we're eating, what we're drinking, what we're, our exercise, you know. And I said, okay, well, that's interesting, we'll do that. So we, uh, had patients, uh, hundreds of patients sign up. Now we're up to uh, about 700 from all around the country. Uh, a few internationally, a lot from Canada and the United Kingdom, English-speaking countries, but a few from other parts of the world, uh, filled out the survey. And then we had a couple really great undergrads who know computer programming, who uh, program software in R to automatically take the data and make these plots. So this is a little bit busy, but this is the survival plot similar to the one I showed you for the small number of patients. It just has 700 in here. And so as you see, we found a bunch of people uh, who were diagnosed in the 70s. And if you look, there's about 100 people who were diagnosed before 2000 and are alive today with metastatic breast cancer. So we're recontacting them. We're asking them for saliva and tumor samples and we're starting to do DNA sequencing on that. But we also got a lot of information about their other habits. And I don't have all the analysis, but in our first analysis, we tried to figure out, you know, what are the differences between the long survivors and the not yet long survivors? And it, it was hard to, to sort this out. Some people thought the long survivors would just have metastatic disease to the bone, but that wasn't the case. Uh, if you were a long-term survivor, you were more likely to have early stage cancer and have recurrence of metastatic disease rather than metastatic disease at diagnosis, known as stage four. And then there was this funny thing, and, and I'm not telling people to drink alcohol, uh, in fact, just the opposite, but it turned out, you know, that the longer-term survivors had a little higher alcohol use, and we thought maybe that was an age cohort effect. To be a long-term survivor, you had to have breast cancer 20, 30 years ago, and so these, uh, we had different habits in this country uh, 20, 30 years ago. So uh, future directions. So what we're working on is contacting and collecting samples and then uh, analyzing other databases for long-term survivors. And it's hard to do this with national databases because it's not really coded in SEER Medicare, so you have to infer it indirectly, but my colleague Gabrielle Rock, who was a oncology fellow here was able to do that. 
And then we're interested in the immunologic characteristics of those cancers. So in short, what I showed you today is why and how we're implementing routine clinical sequencing in oncology, how it's changing the world a little bit, uh, how my group and Dr. Weaver is, are working together to make the existing therapies more precise, and then how we're finding these unusual patients like PEG who you know, may have a more indolent cancer that may not need aggressive treatment. So with that, I thank you. I thank everyone who participated, uh, who I won't uh, name here, and I'll take any questions that you have. Molly. So that was great. I just, I just want to comment that if, you know, in this time when people are challenging the value of academic health centers, I think your talk is the perfect example of the value of an academic health center. Thank you. Well, thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Yeah, so the question, as I'm hearing it, is are you keeping track of bad consequences and can there be some bad consequences? The risk versus benefit. Maybe you'll predict that this drug's going to work and you got it wrong and it doesn't because the DNA sequencing was wrong or misinterpreted. Um, like anything in, in medicine, we try to do the best we can. So the sequencing is done in a CLIA lab. It's interpreted by a molecular pathologist. And one of the things we do in the molecular tumor board is just don't take it as gospel of what we get on the report, is we try to adjudicate based on the best literature available whether the particular mutation is driving the, the gene function. And that's often hard to do. Um, that's a big challenge in the field. There's certain ones that are obvious or so common that it's instantly you, you know that's driving gene function, but there's others that don't. One of the interesting caveats like, so you just have to be aware of all those things that can go wrong. One of the interesting thing one, ones that have been reported is JAK1 and JAK2 mutations. JAK1 and JAK2 mutations uh, occur in certain um, uh, like polycythemia vera or myeloproliferative things of the bone marrow, and that blood can course through a tumor, and you can sequence the tumor and see that mutation. And a lot of people are thinking, oh, that's, that's in the tumor, and I'm going to give the drug that turns that off. But that can be wrong. So that is a problem, and we think the best approach is to have the expert knowledge of the tumor board and build on that knowledge, keep track of the outcomes of the patients, and continuously try to do better. So the question is, are you monitoring that? And, and yes, we have a, we, we're doing it, that as a QI, looking at patient outcomes, and also reporting that in the scientific literature. Thank you very much. Any other questions?